Good morning. If I can have your attention, please. Um, my name is Bryn Zitchi Wanarski, and it's my pleasure to chair this morning's breakfast uh, briefing. Could I just ask you, as a matter of courtesy to the speakers, to at least put your telephones on silent, if not turn them off? Um, on behalf of Michael Green and the, uh, the, the list, um, a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you very much for coming. This morning's topic is uh, Ethical Dilemmas and Practical Solutions, a Review of Ethical Problems in 2011. And this is, I should mention, the last of our CPD uh, breakfast briefings for 2011. But um, like all good programs, I'm here to tell you that they will resume in February of next year. More importantly, today's topic is of extreme importance. Uh, I've been directly, I've been practising for too long. Um, if, if those of you have looked at my um, profile there, will see that I was admitted to practice in 1970 and I came to the bar in the same year, so I've been at this game for far too long, but I still love it. And I've been directly involved in matters of ethics, uh, ethical matters, ethical issues, for, for well over 30 years. And it's very clear to me that ethical standards and duties of lawyers are much higher, the expectations are much higher today than they were 20 or 30 or even 40 years ago. Additionally, uh, I think it's important for us all to realise that the courts have shown a much greater willingness to enter into ethical areas and to prevent actual or potential conflicts of interests and uh, ethical breaches occurring. And that being so, it really is important that we keep ourselves up to date with more recent developments and how to avoid getting into uh, problems in the first place. Now, this morning we have two excellent presenters to talk to you. Uh, closest to me is Theo Ag Alexander, who will speak to you first and give you an overview of some of the recent tribunal cases. And then you'll hear from Megan Fitzgerald, who will address you on some more practical problems uh, that may lead to ethical issues. Uh, so firstly, Theo, if I may just briefly give you some idea about Theo. He practices in um, an area that I have some familiarity with, which I tend to describe as the netherworld between commercial and corporate law and criminal law. He also practices in disciplinary tribunals and trade practices. He's admitted to practice on the 10th of February 2003 signed the bar roll on the 22nd of May 2003. He's appeared in civil and criminal trials and appeals. He also lectures at the undergraduate and master's program at Deakin University, um, teaching in corporate crime, domestic international commercial law, and I think he also there has involvement with ethical issues. Um, so he has a, a good working knowledge of this area. Theo is going to review the legal practice list case outcomes over the last 12 months or so to identify particular problem areas for you. And um, please welcome Theo. Thanks, Brenda. About two weeks ago, I completed marking uh, the exam papers for the subject that I taught this semester at uh, Deakin, which was legal practice and ethics, uh, to about 278 students. Uh, some of them will end up being able to find a job one day. The subject that I taught obviously concerns legal ethics and the ethical training of nascent lawyers. Now, what I thought to myself was that if I do my job properly in respect to that subject, that when those students become practising lawyers, there should really be no need at all for them ever to again attend a class or a seminar like this on the subject of ethics if I do my job properly. Because surely after practical legal training or articles as it used to be called and the CPD points that are associated with becoming a lawyer or the real world experience and there's a great deal of experience in this room that ethical considerations become second nature to a lawyer. It's not very difficult to avoid the very obvious ethical dilemmas like not sleeping with a client or not sleeping with another practitioner's client and 
certainly not sleeping with both your client and the other practitioner's client at the same time. These are fairly obvious ethical problems that we can avoid. Now, what happened in the final lecture was that I cover this subject called Topic 7, Professional Conduct and Practice Rules Revisited, Professional Discipline and Disciplinary Proceedings. Now, in that last lecture, having taught previous 12 lectures about the basic contours of disciplinary uh, proceedings and the ethical obligations, I finished off the course with a look at what happens if it all goes wrong. And I described how part 4.4 of the Legal Pre Profession Act sets out the regulatory regime in respect to disciplinary complaints against lawyers. I explained to the students how there's a division between unsatisfactory professional conduct and professional misconduct at section 4.4.3 and that the Legal Services Commissioner is given power under section 4.4.13 to take lawyers to VCAT for their infractions either under the Act or at common law. Now what I did just to remind us all is to take them through the basis upon which the, the uh, Commissioner might take any one of us to VCAT by quickly overviewing the section. Now, if you'll permit me, I'll do that now. Section 4.4.13, what happens after an investigation is completed? The Commissioner must apply, and this is the important part, to the Tribunal for an order, if he's satisfied that the subject of the investigation is, for that subject, there is a reasonable likelihood that the Tribunal would find that practitioner guilty of professional misconduct. So I said that where there is a professional misconduct question and where there's a reasonable likelihood effectively of a conviction, that the Commissioner is given no discretion other than to take the practitioner to VCAT. The other alternative, of course, is where the Commissioner is satisfied that the practitioner may be guilty of unsatisfactory conduct, the lesser of the two, that the Commissioner is given various types of um, discretion in order to avoid the matter proceeding to VCAT. And that fact gave the students a great deal of hope that uh, on not every occasion you might find yourself in VCAT. But when I went through the practical elements, the practical matters that have arisen in VCAT over 2011, it became clear to me that it really doesn't matter how many lectures that you might attend or how long you've been in practice or how moral you may be, that legal practice these days is a bit like, as Bryn said, standards are raised, courts have their eyes out, legal services commissioner has his claw out, although they've got some reasonable people down there at the moment. I'll tell you why I say that a little bit later. But it is very much still like walking in a minefield. It is very easy for any of us to step onto one of those mines and find ourselves in professional Armageddon. So what do the cases of 2011 show us? What I propose to do is I'm going to take us through five cases from this year and we will have a look at the, at the unfortunate carcasses of those who weren't careful with where they stepped during the course of the year. Some of the names might be familiar. If you know any of these people, feel free to cross yourselves and say there, but for the grace of God, go I. Um, so in each case, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the facts. I'm going to ask for your view about what may have gone wrong and what the uh, uh, appropriate penalty may be and see what the lessons are out of that. So the first uh, case from... February of this year, a practitioner by the name of Isaac Brott. Does anyone know Isaac Brott? <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> well, I think this was the swan song for Mr Brott because this time he went a little bit too far. Uh, in this case, uh, the Commissioner brought him to VCAT on the basis that uh, what he did was this. Uh, he was engaging in sending out letters to 
insurance companies and other law firms, and the law firm that started this investigation was Leggetti Partners, because they asked him on what basis it is that he has instructions to act for a client, a certain client. And what he did was to send effectively letters of demand to clients on the basis of instructions received from a, 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 an organisation called Elite Claims Management, which itself wasn't a law firm, and to then start to act in respect of imaginary instructions for clients that he'd never seen, never spoken to, never received any written authority from, in, had absolutely no contact whatsoever with the client, and yet proceed as if he had full, clear and frank instructions about the circumstances of the accident, which details he received from elite claim management. Now, can anyone tell me what the basic proposition here is, what he did wrong? Yes, well, that's great, terrific, excellent, yes, great, uh, fuel, yes, of course, what I, I, I mean, and, and so when Bryn says, when I say it's a minefield and Bryn says it's easy to reach these, you know, to, to the courts are, uh, 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 are tough on these things, that was a pretty obvious infraction that it's pretty critical to uh, require instruction. So what a strange lesson for a man who, uh, according to the plea material, uh, is 59 years old, uh, has been in practice since 1970, uh, who was stabbed 19 <coughs> times in the course of a robbery in 1990 and uh, therefore uh, felt that uh, there was no real problem with what he did. And the tribunal, after identifying his complete lack of remorse and basic deep misunderstanding of what the problem was, uh, decided on this occasion, what do you think would be an appropriate punishment for Mr Brott? Hang on. <laughs> I thought they looked for orders like that, but they didn't have jurisdiction. But uh, uh, any alternatives? Come on, what, do you, what would you do with Mr Brott? I mean, you know, you know his background, you know he's been in, 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 in before various tribunals. I mean, you look up Brot and, and legal services something, about 10 cases come up. What would you do with him? Strike him off? Well, this time, that's exactly what they did do. They referred it to the Supreme Court for action by the Supreme Court. Now, at 59, we're going to be saved from Mr Brot. So, um, uh, that was... What's the lesson out of that one? Very... What, what a, what a, a foolish uh, uh, a man to engage in that conduct. Uh, all right, next one. This is, a, this is a lot sadder, this case. This is from March 2011. Does anyone know a practitioner uh, by the name of Anthony Comito? Comito. All right, all right. Yeah, maybe, okay. Um, this might be something that could happen to all of us. Mr Comito... Uh, son and daughter were involved in a property venture with a, a very good friend of the family, Mr Suniti. And as you know, the, there were various documents that are required to be signed, uh, solicitor's guarantee that I've uh, explained the content of the document and they understand what it means, the mortgages usually. Of course, what did Mr Comito do? He signed the guarantee on behalf of... Uh, uh, or where Mr Suniti should have signed and Mr Suniti then enters into the transaction and what do you think happens next? What, does a, what are the uh, usual types of family friends become? Ex-family friends when there's a dispute about money? And of course, what did Mr Suniti then do? I never signed the document. Um, uh, non est factum, right? I never signed, it was never explained, I don't know. So poor Mr Comito. Trust, faith, belief that it was a very minor matter, something which is relatively new, uh, given that he's been in practice also since uh, 1970 as well. Age and experience clearly is no protection against ethical problems. Um, he stated his explanation, he knew that it was wrong to sign the document without having done the things he was certifying and regarded it as a mere technicality. 
stupidly, he says, regarded as a mere technicality. Um, what do you think should be done with Mr Camito? Let me just give you his background. 65 years of age, born in Eritrea, studied at Mel University of Melbourne, admitted in 1970, uh, joined the Australian Army, rose to the rank of Major, commenced private practice in Melbourne and has practiced so, so ever since, never a complaint against him. Views? What to do with uh, Mr Camito? Appropriate disposition in your view. Ultimately, this is what it all comes down to. We are, we, we are judges of our professional brethren. What do we do? No idea. Strike him off. No, all right, good. We've got a, we've got a baseline. Don't strike him off. Uh, uh, accepts a reprimand. All right. What did he get? Fine him. For fa he got a fine. For failing to be cautious about that technicality, cost him $10,000. Harsh disposition. Hands up harsh disposition. Fair disposition. Oh, God. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's got to do a little bit of crime, you see. Your heart softens, I think. Uh, what about? Um, all right, this was a very straightforward one. It was Bernard Horsley, April two thousand and eleven. <laughs> Um, Mr Horsley was approached by two clients, Janice Light, the mother, and Luke Watts, the son, uh, in about 2005. He was approached to make an application to the Victims of Crime Assistance Tribunal on their behalf. And by inference from the decision, some time passed and he hadn't acted in respect to their application and they were concerned. They approached him. He said that the reason that nothing's happened is because the VOCAT application was struck out and so there was nothing more to be done on the file. Dissatisfied with that, they went to another solicitor to ask what they could do about it. That other solicitor, of course, what's the first thing that that solicitor would do? Uh, uh, well, yeah, speak to the client, ask for, a, ask for the other practitioner for what? A copy of the file? Mm. So, to add insult to injury, to go from the frying pan into the fire, what he does is decide to just not do anything in respect to handing over the, fire, the files. Um, he fails to deliver the files and hence it finds its way to the Legal Services Commissioner who start their investigation. And what, the, what is the reality of the situation? What do you think the nub of uh, this matter before the tribunal was? What did Mr Horsley do? Sorry? Nothing. Nothing. Didn't, act. Did, didn't act, didn't do anything about it, but what, what is the ethical, pro what did he do though, <laughs> though that would bring him, you're like my favourite students, the ones that talk at the front. <laughs> the ones, that, you know, so, good. So what do you think he did? Uh, well, well, he told the clients that the reason nothing's happened is because your matter's been struck out. Do you think that was true? No. no. The quick, easy, cheap route of it's not my fault, the matter was struck out, forget about it, go home. Is it something that any of us could do? We all sit here going, no, it's ridiculous. But our frailties, our desire not to create and cause troubles for ourselves, a very quick sentence, just, it's dismissed, don't worry about it, move on. Not that I'm advocating that. This is, um, <laughs> it's a different ethics lecture I give. <laughs> um, so what does the, uh, what happens? Pleads guilty to unsatisfactory professional conduct and professional misconduct. A relatively modest disposition for someone who so flagrantly lied. He had to pay $2,000 to the Legal Services Board uh, in respect to the professional misconduct charge and $500 in respect to the unsatisfactory professional conduct charge 
And the kicker, of course, is the uh, uh, fees that the uh, sorry the cost of the of the um, commissioner, which was at five and a half thousand. So about a seven thousand dollar lie for Mr. Horsley. That one was. Um, fourthly. Does anyone know Michael McNamara? Yeah, okay, thanks for acknowledging that. Michael, I know Michael too. I've always thought he was a lovely bloke. Uh, he's been around a long time. I'm from Essendon, he's from my side of town. <coughs> lovely practitioner, always works hard for the clients. Won a uh, pro bono award to, by, uh, at the Law Institute. But dear Michael, really buggered up on this occasion. Uh, and again, there but for the grace of God go I. What did he do? Well, he was acting for a, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Vallia in drawing up a will. Mr. and Mrs. Vallia owned a block of land and he, Mr. McNamara, prepared the will and he set, he, he uh, uh, included a certain friend of Mr. and Mrs. Vallier's, Mr. Kerr, as the executor of the will. But as the executor of the will, he was also a beneficiary under the will in respect of that block of land. He was going to receive it. So what Mr. McNamara then did was... After the uh, uh, death of Mrs. Vallier, he then commenced acting for Mr. Kerr against the estate of Mr. Mrs. Vallier in respect to the block. So having prepared the will he subsequent, and, and, and made Mr. Vallier a beneficiary, he subsequently acted on behalf of Mr. Kerr against the estate um, in respect to the will which he drew. Now, does that strike anyone as so obviously wrong that it's surprising that a practitioner of 20-odd years standing uh, would engage in that type of conduct? I, that's the only basis upon which, when I say I was surprised, that it must be a minefield, because these three that we've heard so far are so patently obvious, and yet these are the matters that have come to the tribunal's attention in 2011 and 2. The ages and experience of these practitioners, none of these have been youthful practitioners. Um, so Mrs Vallier died and uh, the dispute arose. Mr Kerr made a... Uh, sorry, the estate of Mr and Mrs Vallier made a complaint and it started because not only did he engage in this clear conflict of interest, but he then was alleged to have prepared the will in circumstances where Mrs Vallier had provided, or one had been provided on her behalf to Mr McNamara, saying that she completely lacked testamentary capacity and she was suffering effectively from dementia. And yet he got her to sign the will. So, what do you do with poor Michael McNamara? Views? Uh, you can go from the reprimand right through to the uh, recommend that his name be removed from the role. Reprimand? Anything else? Fine. Fine him? The role. I strike him off. Who's it strike him off the roll? Right. <laughs> of course, a good friend of his. <laughs> yeah. Knock him out. Rub him out. Yeah, all right. And you can have a laugh over a drink about that. Um, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, a punitive and therapeutic sentence. Uh, the respondent shall not act as a solicitor for the executors or beneficiaries of a will or the administrators of deceased estates until the respondent has undertaken workshops in relation to conflicts of interest. Equal, equal to 10 CPD points. However, for, uh, uh, pay costs, costs set at $25,000. Not a small amount of money for anyone, unless you're all doing a lot better than, than I am. So it's a significant, it's a significant impost. That was Michael. How are we going for time, Bryn? Three or four minutes, all right. Uh, what have we got left? We've got Andrew Nguyen. Uh, 
trust money, gets a, uh, acted for the vendors in a sale, respondent received payment of the deposit from the purchaser uh, and did not provide the purchaser with a, or from his client, with a trust account receipt. Effectively, he said, I simply had the cheque and passed it on. And that is what the factual scenario is. He simply physically had the cheque and went and delivered it to another party. Is that an ethical offence or not? What is, what is the... Hands up who says it's not an ethical offence. For those of all of you who say it is, what is the ethical... What did he do wrong? Transit money. Transit money. Oh, genius. Yes, transit money. Now, hence you're not, your name's not on these pieces of paper. Trans <laughs> <laughs> transit money. He said, the problem is, of course, by collecting that cheque and delivering it, he was an employed solicitor. And we all know that the practising certificate does not permit an employed solicitor, or well, his didn't, to uh, deal with trust monies. And so, therefore, the collection of the cheque and delivery constituted the, a trust transit money, which itself is a form of trust money, and therefore committed a breach. Uh, says, I really didn't know. I'm sorry, I really had no idea that that was trust money. What would you do with him? Training. Training? Well, you'd think that after McNamara that he'd get, that, that'd be the sort of appropriate therapeutic remedy. Um, uh, respondent cannot apply for a practising certificate for 12 months be beginning 20 October 2011. Before holding a practising certificate again, the respondent must undertake courses over 12 months relating to the obligation and responsibilities of practitioner in relation to trust accounts equal to 10 CPD points. The respondent cannot engage in legal practice on his own account unless he first holds a practising certificate for 12 months, which limits him to practising as an employee. Respondent pays all the applicant's costs. Harsh. Harsh? Young bloke, innocent mistake. He, he handed on a piece of paper, but he's been rubbed out for a good 12 months, plus a further 12 months of being hobbled. So, on the other hand, trust money can go to the core of our role. And, and, and you sound just like um, uh, <laughs> Judge Lasava, Vice President of the, of the list. Look, there's one more matter I wanted to tell you about, um, if you'd just give me a moment. Uh, from 2011. My own. Look at the eyes. <laughs> oh, this is good. <laughs> okay. Minefields are everywhere. Watch out, kids. What can happen is this. I had a client, 2004 to 2000. Is this being recorded? Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's, I don't, it's fine. I'll just go on. I had a client, name unrevealed, who I... You know when there's some clients you bust your hump for? You know, you really give them everything you've got. You'll see them out of hours, you'll stretch yourself, you'll do various services for them all above board, but many that you wouldn't bother doing for many other clients. This guy was an elderly Greek guy. My grandfather was Greek. I felt very sorry for him. He was blind. He was a pensioner. He had a very hard life. He's been involved in more traffic and motor accidents. I mean, who gets hit in a tram twice? <laughs> well, this bloke did, right? He had a whole series of disasters. And so I acted for him. When the psychiatric report from his VCAT matter, which I appealed to the Supreme Court, which he then said, do a special leave application to the High Court, which I said, look, we've gone far enough, uh, which he then did himself, um, I realised that the psychiatric report that said he was a... He had some disease about uh, being uh, desiring litigation. I can't remember the name of it, but there's actually a psychiatric disease where people are almost sexually interested in litigation. <laughs> now, I just told him to buy a dog, you know, pup. No, I mean, not for that reason, but just get a, get a, just get, just get a friend. I mean, just get a friend, right? Anyway, so I do all this, hear nothing. And I say to him, mate, we've gone as far as we can go. The end is the end. Don't hear anything for a year. And then I get a call from the Legal Service Commissioner. Your client has made a complaint. Of all the people, of all the ungrateful bastards that have crossed my desk, this one. And so I gave an explanation. I can tell you they have a lovely process where they've got a, a, a quick resolution team. They'll just give you a call, have a discussion. If it's rubbish, they'll deal with it. Well, lest you think I'm making all of it up, this is just, you know, just to get, get a laugh, I just brought with you the uh, letter 
of exculpation in my name from the Legal Services Commissioner, saying, I refer to your, your telephone conversation about this complaint. The complaint is hereby dismissed. When I have a difficult client, I wear this under my chest in chambers as sort of an amulet to protect me <laughs> from these evil clients, <laughs> just in case. Look, to conclude, the minefield that legal practice is uh, requires exactly what I've been teaching students all semester. It requires a moral compass. We all develop a moral compass and have our own moral compass. Seminars like this, really, I wasn't going to blow smoke or tell Grandma I had to suck eggs. You understand your ethical obligations. It's just a timely reminder that it is easy to infract. It is easy to transgress. And the simple option that some people take is where they get themselves into trouble. We all need to find our own true north. And can I just finish uh, by quoting from uh, Steve Mark uh, about a moral compass? And you know what? Given that that quote's now missing... Uh, no, here it is. Right. <laughs> I was just about to... Right. The rules... Now, this is what we concluded in our lectures. The rules of professional conduct are merely a framework of statements that describe ethical behaviour. They are not ethical rules or principles. They are only a baseline of conduct and should not prevent lawyers from acting as they ordinarily do. Good ethical practice thus involves a legal practitioner considering the impact of their actions on justice, the integrity of the legal system and the impact of their decision on the preservation of relationships. For Professor Pastuma, Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina, this means treating clients not as objects but as humans and applying our wisdom based on our world experience and our knowledge. According to him, we are not only authorised to raise moral issues with our clients, but we have a professional responsibility to do so. So the lesson, my friends, from today, tread carefully through the minefield and have an ethically safe 2012. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Theo, for what I may describe as a, a thoughtful, insightful and at times highly amusing discussion of the issues that confront um, you practitioners.